Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey everybody, Jessa here, back with the next episode of the Better Sex Podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in and spending this time with me. I know there are literally millions, maybe billions of podcasts at this point, and I just so appreciate your attention and your your company as I sit in my recording closet <laughs> and do the show. I am so passionate about, well, I guess about sex in general, but especially about helping people with sex. I mean, I really have made it my life's work, right, to help couples improve their sex life and find joy and connection and pleasure with each other. And I see so many, you know, a certain number of clients in my therapy practice, and that's so limited. So that was a big reason why I started the podcast, right? A free resource that can, I suppose, reach an infinite number of people, but certainly way more than I can see in Seattle. And I'm always looking for new ways to reach out and provide value, provide support and guidance and inspiration and information that can make a difference for you. So in addition to this podcast, you know, I do have a mailing list where I send out links to useful things, you know, links to the podcast and blog posts and things like that, but also links to other articles, other information for you. For everybody that is on that list, I'm offering monthly webinars that are free, that are just open Q&A, so you can ask questions. I mean, I may not have all the answers, but I'm going to do my best, or maybe I can guide you or get back to you if, if there's something I can't answer. You know, I'm just looking for ways to help. So I would love to have you join me. One way you can do that, an easy way to get on that list, is to sign up for my free, my free little giveaway about my top 10 sex tips. These are not like cosmopolitan-like things about get a trapeze or, you know, use an ice cube. It's not that kind of stuff. It's about, you know, more like conceptual ways to approach sex that are really going to make a difference. So if you're interested in that, you can go to sexwithoutstress.com slash tips. That way you'll get the sign up. You can get that PDF sent to you. And then as long as you confirm an email, you'll be added to my mailing list. Anyway, love to have you join me. Certainly also open if you have other ideas about how I can reach out and help. I would love to hear them. So on this podcast, I have such a variety of topics and it, it sort of never ceases to amaze me how much there is to talk about when we're just talking about sex. I think I'm at Oh, just gone over a year now of recording the show weekly, and I'm just not out of ideas. There's still so many I've got scheduled and so many more I want to do. This topic is something that has shown up in, uh, actually, it's, if you if you get my top 10 sex steps, you're going to see that being present in the moment is one of them, and enjoying the journey, not being goal-oriented, is another. They're sort of related, and they totally point to the topic today, which is mindfulness and sex. So this idea of learning to be in the moment and not chase our thoughts and worries and fears and anxieties and expectations and judgments, but to just be with what's happening now in our body and with our partner is so crucial for sex. And not only that, as as my guest is going to share, this is a really powerful practice and technique to deal with sexual dysfunctions, sexual issues. So it's a benefit if you're not having any problems at all, but it's even more important if you are. So my guest today is Dr. Lori Brado. Okay, and she works at the University of British Columbia Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and she's a registered psychologist, and she runs a lab that focuses mostly on mindfulness-based interventions for women's sexual health. Now, we do talk in the show about one little pilot study they did around men with uh, performance anxiety, 
And they've done some also around prostate cancer surgery. But anyway, she's been involved in this for the last 15 years in research proving the effectiveness of mindfulness techniques. So today we're going to learn a little bit about what mindfulness is, how it's relevant to various sexual concerns, and then she's going to go over a lot of ideas for basic ways to start developing a mindfulness practice. What does that look like? What, what do you do, <laughs> right? What are the, some, some of the supports you could get and how it might progress over time? So I really hope you're going to find this useful. Enjoy. Lori, thank you so much for being with me today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks. Yeah, I'm um, looking forward to this topic, mindfulness, because uh, it seems, you know, it seems like you hear it everywhere now, all over the media, all over, you know, uh, print. So I'm curious to talk more about mindfulness specifically, but especially how it applies to sex. Because mm-hmm. yeah, know, I don't I don't see that written about that much. So that that is true. And, you know, as you've mentioned, there's been a lot of attention um, in the media, in the research, in various kinds of clinical settings around what is mindfulness, how does it work, for whom does it best work, and I've really mostly been interested in. And we extend those findings specifically to people who have sexual concerns. Okay. So maybe we should start with some of those basic questions. Like how do you even define mindfulness and how does it work and who's it best for? (laughs) Yeah. So mindfulness really comes from a, a larger practice of meditation, which has a very long history, at least 3,000 years. Um, it's a core aspect of uh, Buddhist practice in many sectors of, of the Eastern world. And it's really been over the last 40 or so years that that form of meditation has been somewhat secularized and brought into mainstream Western healthcare. And it was really through the work of John Kabat-Zinn, who became introduced to meditation when he was a uh, postdoctoral fellow at at an institute of technology in Massachusetts. And he, he, as a molecular biologist, didn't really have any training or prior knowledge about these kinds of approaches. But after attending a seminar and starting to apply meditation in his own life, he said, wow, this is profoundly useful. And could we simplify the instructions and introduce it into our Western world? So essentially what John Kabat-Zinn is he defined mindfulness, which is the practical day-to-day application of meditation, and really defined it as a present moment, non-judgmental awareness in which each thought and each sensation in the moment is acknowledged and observed just as it is. And so it's really about this continual attention training where one brings the focus of their attention onto a very specific location, either in their body or on their breath, and continues to do that even though the mind wants to be pulled elsewhere and and get distracted. So it was really John Kabat-Zinn's seminal work in the mid to late 1970s, and he first applied these strategies to patients who were attending a chronic pain clinic at Mm -hmm. Massachusetts General Hospital. And uh, he approached the physicians in that program and said, give me your patients who are not responding to any of the conventional treatments that you're using for chronic pain, the various medications, the surgeries, the physical rehabilitations. And his idea is if we can teach them to accept their pain, that Mm -hmm. that might be a really helpful and somewhat novel way of helping them to live with their pain. And it turns out he was right. All right. So it sounds like a lot of overlap with meditation, but it's it's secularized, right? It's taken out the spiritual aspect of that. That's and it's right. also it's also a little bit simpler mm-hmm. said in instruction. So it's maybe a narrow segment of what meditation involves. Exactly. So okay. within mindfulness practice, we don't talk about or refer to stages of insight. Um, we don't talk about, you know, many of the, I think, kind of common expressions that are woven into meditation practice if if one was, you know, a Buddhist person. Say. Right, right. Okay. But this doesn't need to be a barrier for people listening who think, oh, this is some sort of religious practice or this is too overwhelming. This is this is a doable phenomenon or experience that people can have. Yeah, absolutely. And it really, regardless of one's own religious affiliation or lack of affiliation thereof, there's no aspect of the instructions that make any reference to religion. 
Right. And, and yet still a practice, right? Like <laughs> this isn't the kind of thing people hear the instructions and boom, off they go, right? This is, this is the kind of thing that's going to benefit from repetition and practice and viewing it that way, I'd imagine. Yeah. And, you know, several people have used the analogy of going to the gym and we go to the gym to exercise a muscle. It's not the case that you go to the gym once, you exercise that muscle and suddenly that muscle is now set (laughs) and equipped for the rest of your life. And so in a parallel way, we're essentially exercising the muscle of the mind and it needs to be continually exercised in order for it to carry out this function of being able to pay attention moment by moment, non-judgmentally. Yeah, yeah. All right, so where's the overlap of how you're using mindfulness with sex? Mm -hmm. So I I started this work when I was completing um, a residency and a fellowship at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh Um, And that was where I was first introduced to mindfulness. And it wasn't for sexual concerns. It was for a different population and for a different issue. But I sort of had a light bulb moment because many of the women that I was seeing in my research program, which was focused on sexual difficulties after having survived cancer, and many of those women told me that they had just a fundamental disconnect with their bodies. They couldn't sense what was happening in their body. They felt as if their genitals were no longer capable of responding. They couldn't feel increases in heart rate associated with arousal. And so I, I sort of had a moment of, wow, well, we've got, you know, I've, I've been introduced to and have, and at that time I should mention, I also began practicing mindfulness myself. So okay. downloaded all sorts of audio guides, um, immersing myself in the literature and practice of mindfulness. So it struck me that, you know, if this strategy could be so useful for helping others to connect with sensations in the here and now, could that strategy also be useful to women who are describing, again, this fundamental disconnect with sexual sensations in their body? So it started out very experimentally, again, because as I was learning the practice myself and also wanting to apply it with others and then study what happens when you apply it to others, <laughs> yeah. it it was a two-year period of, of um, a lot of learning and a lot of um, self-practice. And so the earliest kind of pilot study that we undertook in, uh, together with the oncologists at the, at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance was for women who had survived um, cervical cancer. And given the nature of their surgery, again, they had no sensa- they, they reported that they had no sensations in their genitals. So brought them into my office one by one. We did the, med- the, the mindfulness and meditation exercises together. And then I studied what happened over the next six months. And the women filled out some validated questionnaires and indicated that they started to feel again. They started mm-hmm. to feel sexual sensations. They started to have desire again. Their sexual satisfaction started to improve. And so that really then I think provided the foundation for us expanding the program and then bringing it out to many other populations of women and and many more women in general. Wow. Okay. And what and the only thing different was this mindfulness practice. I guess you must have ruled out just the effects of time going by too. Yeah. So that became important to do in our subsequent studies because of course, in addition to me doing the the mindfulness practices with them, I was asking them about sexuality. They were in my office and I was trying to exert a non-judgmental stance. I was interested in what they were saying, all of which can be really helpful for addressing (laughs) sexual concerns as you know. So then in our subsequent studies where we had a comparison group or a control group, we controlled for some of those factors, like the passage of time, filling out questionnaires, talking to an interested provider, et cetera. Right. Okay. And then I I suppose your use of this or or other people's use of this has gone beyond women, gone beyond, Mm -hmm. you know, cancer survival, right? Like this is applicable for a number of different kinds of sexual concerns, I would think. Yeah. So after the the initial studies with gynae cancer survivors, we then, um, again, expanded the group a little bit more based on the feedback that women provided for us. And we brought this to larger populations of women who were having difficulties with sexual desire. And we know the data tell us it affects at least a third of women who will report chronic and quite distressing and bothersome low levels of sexual interest. So not being motivated for sex, not thinking about sex, not being interested in it. So we've since done a a number of studies, again, starting small and then gradually building into uh, 
larger study designs with longer follow-up periods of time. We've also brought this program to women with a diagnosis of a chronic genital pain condition called provoked mm. vestibulodynia or PVD. Yeah. And so these are women who report really excruciating pain with any contact to the vulva, uh, whether it's sexual activity or a tampon or even a finger or even sometimes even just the seam on their jeans. Yeah, yeah. And it made a lot of sense for us to bring mindfulness to that population. Again, because if we go back to John Kabat-Zinn's original work, it was folks with chronic pain that yeah. he found the, the mindfulness sessions to be quite useful for. So we've since done a few different studies among that population of women with genital pain. And now we're doing a study among prostate cancer survivors. So these are men who after their prostate cancer uh, surgery, well, whether it's surgery or radiation therapy, the vast majority of them have permanent um, erectile difficulties, so right. difficulties getting erection. And for a lot of those men, we know even if they still retain some erectile function after their treatment, eventually within two years, the vast majority lose their ability to, to have an erection. Mm. And so the approach uh, in using mindfulness for that population is, you know, let's accept that the erections either are not going to come back or they're going to be unreliable. And how can we broaden the range of sexual activities that you engage in? How can we broaden your definition of what you call sexual satisfaction? And so for that study, it's the, the survivors plus their partners. So it's couples participating in a group with two facilitators. And, and there we found that the participation of the partner has been really useful because oftentimes yeah. if, if the partner's a woman, she's the one who says, yeah, 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 we don't need to have intercourse. Let's do other things. You know, I want to do these other things. And so uh, the partner's buy-in has been really important for the yeah. study. Well, and of course, now you're totally overlapping with what I do in my sex therapy practice, right? Which is trying to, to you know, let's accept what is and work with the pieces we have and broaden this definition of, you know, what's successful and what's satisfactory. Yeah, and that's so important because, you know, still now in 2019, there seems to be this societal preoccupation with, you know, only one way to have satisfying sex. Right, right. Um, yeah. it's, and it's very heterocentric. It's penis and vagina. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the culmination of which is orgasm. That's the only way to be satisfied. And it's, yeah. it's frankly wrong and it's misleading <laughs> and, it's, and it's harmful. I know it creates so much pressure, all those expectations. That's a whole, I mean, I, that's what I talk about all the time, but it's yes. nice to hear this overlap with mindfulness around, yeah, you know, yeah. acceptance and just being with what is. Exactly. Hi, it's Jessa here taking just a quick break. Thanks for listening so far. I wanted to let you know about the sex quiz that I've put together called How Healthy Is Your Sex Life? I've taken a close look at the typical ways that I see couples get into trouble with sex, including avoidance, neglect, negativity, distraction, and boredom. And the free quiz will score your individual results based on these factors. And then I provide my recommendations and ideas, including my top 10 sex tips, which will help you make instant improvement. If you'd like to take the quiz and see how healthy your sex life is, you can do it right now at sexhealthquiz.com. Now, it also strikes me that it would be really useful uh, with something like performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, again, I don't know if there's studies on that, but it, it, you know, all that worry that takes people out of the moment is such a big problem for so many people. Yeah, we, we published a study um, middle of last year, middle of 2018, that was, it was just a small pilot study because we weren't quite sure if the men uh, with the performance anxiety were going to be open to this approach. But essentially, these were men with a situational form of sexual difficulty. So they had no problems being sexual on their own. You know, right. They could get their erection. They were happy with how long it took them to reach um, an orgasm. But as soon as they were with a partner and they were flooded with performance anxiety and, and became concerned about how is this going to go? How's my partner evaluate me? And that anxiety about the, the performance is what caused the sexual concern. So we did right. just a little pilot study, just looking at the, the mindfulness intervention. And we found 
I think not surprisingly, that it worked. It helped the men label their performance anxiety as just something the brain does. It's not fact. It's not something to be followed. It's just something that our brain does. It produces these negative thoughts and you can choose to run away with them or you can choose to stay present and focus on your body. So really promising findings from that small study that I think would encourage um, sex therapists and clinicians who work with men and women with performance anxiety that mindfulness could be a really useful strategy there. Yeah, yeah. So what what would you say about the use of mindfulness when people are not having sexual difficulties? Right? Like it's, it's well, one thing as a sort of treatment approach, but it also seems yeah. like it would be, you know, just such a resource for sex in general. Yeah. And, you know, the research tells us that sure, about 30% of people probably have a sexual dysfunction that meet the formal criteria for how we make a dysfunction uh, diagnosis. But a lot more people than that are just frankly sexually dissatisfied. Right. You know, they're they're not having the best sex they could be having. Um, they maybe remember a time in the past when they were having much greater sex or it was much more rewarding. Um, and then maybe a combination of life taking over and stress and lack of effort, et cetera. It's just not satisfying anymore. And so again, for the same reasons, mindfulness is really relevant to, to that much larger group of people. So how can we take the kind of good enough sex that you're having and infuse mindfulness into it so that it can be maybe not every time optimal, but increase the occurrence that it that it's much, much more enjoyable and satisfying for you. Yeah. It's, it's incredible that just paying attention can exert that kind of outcome. Right, right. I mean, it's something I sort of teach too, or, or I mean, at least in work with clients, right? Being present in the moment and then enjoying the journey, being with what is as opposed to so goal-oriented can just, it can make such a difference for people. And it's it's kind of a no-brainer, right? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's totally about our brain, right? It's all about our brain. Yeah, um, and yeah. Yet at the same time, it's a no-brainer, the, the notion that, wow, how much more can we enjoy things if we're actually there? Right. You know, and I always say to people, if you're going to be having sex, at least show up. <laughs> yeah. Right? And stay for a while, right? And like don't just whiz through the moment, you yeah. know, just, like be there. Yeah. So how do you recommend that people practice this? Should people learn this as a mindfulness practice outside of sex and then apply it? in sex? Or do, you, or do you think listeners could just sort of take this and run with it immediately in their sex life? You know, it's. I think it's a good empirical question that you're posing, which is, is it just as effective if we just bring this to sex? And we actually don't know the answer to that because we haven't studied that. We haven't compared right. those two groups. How we teach it in our groups, and we've been teaching it this way now for about 14 years, and it's all outlined um, in my book, Better Sex Through Mindfulness, is we actually recommend that people start with a regular non-sexual mindfulness practice. So okay. you know, at least 15 minutes a day, every single day, where they might do a body scan. So follow an audio uh, recording, especially if the person is brand new to mindfulness. I do highly recommend that the person follow along with an audio guide. If this is a person who's already very well experienced, they may prefer to do it self-guided without listening to the voice. In our groups, what we do is after about four weeks of practicing just on your own, we then progressively introduce this into gradually more sexual and, and body focused and then eventually partner related kinds of encounters. And so how we might make that how we make that transition is we have one exercise that we run with our women where again after they've now done say four weeks of doing a body scan on their own, they use a handheld mirror and look at their genitals. And so they're still paying attention to the mm -hmm. sensations they feel now we've added the element of the kind of visual sensation, the visual feedback. So focusing on color, shapes, sizes, letting go of any judgments that come up. And, and often women are plagued with negative judgments right. when they look at their right. genitals. You know, it's too wrinkly. It's too this. It's too that. It's not good enough. And so even just that exercise of, of examining your own body and your own uh, genitals can be a really powerful way, again, of strengthening that mindfulness muscle. Right. So it's usually through that kind of an exercise that we then start to bring mindfulness into progressively more sexual situations. And would you go from something like the mirror 
or examining your genitals to then bringing mindfulness into masturbation, like solo or not even masturbation exactly, but sexual touch by yourself. And then maybe even towards more sexual excitement before you would bring in a partner. Bingo. So okay. we have an exercise that we've um, developed and it's called sexual sensations awareness. And essentially it's masturbation without the goal oriented part. Right, right. Right. So touching your whole body, including your genitals over a more prolonged period of time and letting go of any kind of feeling of wanting to get to the end and wanting to reach an orgasm. In fact, orgasm is not the goal and arousal is not the goal. It's really awareness of sensations, but we're including touch to those erogenous areas. Right, right. And are there other mindfulness practices that somebody might do with a partner that are not sexual? You know, like sometimes I use eye gazing exercises or something like yeah. that, which I would imagine could be used in a mindfulness yeah. Eye gazing is a beautiful practice. And in our clinical work, we, we use that same um, exercise, but we kind of do it through the lens of mindfulness. So notice what comes up, what sensations in your body as you're gazing into your partner's eyes. So it's very much, again, through the language of what do you feel in the here and now. Um, and that might also include the size and shape of your partner's eyes or looking at other parts of them. So really concretely focused on sensations, what you notice. And then as you know, Jessa, well, there's sensate focus, which has a long, long, long history, dates right. back to the mid-1950s. And it's essentially a structured, wonderful touching exercise that Masters and Johnson developed. And they never used the term mindfulness or meditation, but when you read their original instructions, it is a mindfulness practice. Right. 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 One partner touches the other and the person receiving the touch tunes in and lets go of expectations and yeah. notices what they feel. It is a mindfulness practice that's not sexual. Right, right. And you're not chasing your thoughts. I mean, at least, you're, you know, the work is to not chase those thoughts, right? Just to stay exactly. in the moment right now. Yeah. And more recently, um, Linda Weiner and Constance Avery Clark, who have published a almost like a self-help how-to book on, on Sensate Focus, in their current writing, and, and they, uh, of course, trained at the Masters and Johnson Institute, they have now included reference to mindfulness and how sensate focus is essentially a mindful practice. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting how they, they sort of discovered that on their own. You know, yeah. A whole different language, but the same yeah. idea. Same idea. Yeah. Yeah. So again, the concepts aren't new. I think what's new is are very deliberately applying this to sexual concerns. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned doing a body scan. Is that is that sort of the totality of a mindfulness practice? You know, I'm thinking about where to suggest people start. And it sounds like finding some sort of audio guide could be very useful. But is, is there more to it or other options than just doing the body scan? Yeah, lots more. So we, okay. we actually start in our group with an eating meditation. So... Uh, we pass around a plate of raisins. Again, we didn't make this up. Others have done this before. Yeah, yeah I have heard of this it. actually now that you mention it. So, you know, you can use the raisin as a beautiful introduction, especially if the person has never practiced or been introduced to mindfulness before. It's a wonderful um, entry into it because most of us can relate to eating raisins, you know, by the handful and popping right, right. in our <laughs> mouth and, you know, <laughs> not yes, yeah. Exactly, thoughtlessly. And then from there, we do move on to um, a few weeks of the body scan, but we also do mindfulness of breath. So where the guide is specifically encouraging the person to notice uh, where in the body the breath makes itself known. So is it the mm. nostrils, the chest, the diaphragm, somewhere else? So that's a separate practice. We also do walking mindfulness practices. So this is not the same as as you're walking to the office, just pay attention. <laughs> this is a, a very different, very deliberate walk from A to B, B to A, essentially walking back and forth, back and forth over 15 or 20 minutes while paying attention and huh. noticing we also in our groups do a stretch and breath mindfulness, which looks a little bit like yoga, but not anywhere near as strenuous as yoga. And again, the idea is by introducing some gentle movements, um, can they grapple with tension and discomfort right. and sometimes even pain as you're reaching your hand over your head? And then one of the really key practices is mindfulness of thoughts. 
Mm. And so this is where the person just sort of lets thoughts run wild. And rather than getting caught up in the content of them, they might observe the fact that they are having these thoughts. So they might say, oh, I'm having three thoughts right now and I'm having planning thoughts. I'm having worry thoughts, but they're doing so from a very present oriented perspective, not getting caught up in the content. Right. And my view is that that practice, the mindfulness of thoughts is so, so, so key for sexuality. Again, because it's rife with negative judgments and stereotypes and bad thoughts about I'm broken, et cetera. Right, so right. that's where the rubber really hits the road with bringing mindfulness to sexuality. Yeah, yeah. So what about resources? Like where do people find either these guided uh, mindfulness practices or, you know, I've heard uh, clients talk about apps they have on their phone. <laughs> like mm-hmm. where, where are the places people could get some support if they're interested in learning more? Yeah, I think because mindfulness has become so popular, there are actually many, many resources available. So you mentioned the apps. There's Calm, Headspace, Happify. There's various apps. Some of them are are fee-based. Others are not. In fact, Calm was rated Apple's top app of the year uh, last year. And so that's one option for people. Okay. Um, another another option is is just good old YouTube and um, entering in the search engine uh, body scan or mindfulness of breath and then uh, locating them that way. There's also many, many community centers. So, you know, the same places where you can sign up for a basket weaving course or, <laughs> right. you know, swimming lessons. Many of them also offer eight-week mindfulness programs. There's also Dharma, uh, so a little bit more with a slightly Buddhist leaning, though not necessarily Buddhist teaching in the classes, but centers like that. So Dharma centers uh, also offer mindfulness. In my book, of course, there's no audio that goes um, uh, along with it. It's all, but many of the exercises are written out in the book. And so for folks who are interested in actually reading the the exercises ahead of time, that's an option. And then they can do their own self-guided practice. Right. Great. Okay. And so how, how can people learn a little bit more about you or get in touch or, or are there other offerings that you've got that you want to mention? So I love connecting with people on Twitter. I think Twitter has just been fantastic for taking the science and bringing it out to the masses. So my Twitter handle is Dr. Lori Brado. So that's Dr. Lori Brado. I also have a uh, research website that lists all the different studies we're doing right now. And so if people want to find out what are the studies where we're using mindfulness, and we also publish the findings of our different research projects on that website, and that's www.brotolab.com. Okay. Uh, so brotolab.com. And uh, of course, there's telephones. People can phone me. <laughs> I'm pretty accessible. <laughs> telephones? What are those? Yeah. <laughs> pretty accessible if you were to do a Google search. Um, and then uh, the book itself, of course, is available on, on Amazon and Indigo Chapters websites too. Yeah, great. I'll put all those links in the show notes too, so people don't have to be jotting this down as they're running around the lake or whatever they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we want them to run, be running around the lake much. Right. Fully, yes, exactly. Down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Oh, my pleasure. It was great to speak with you about this really important topic. Yeah. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. 
And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web, and you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.